Hello, everyone, and welcome to another wonderful day of physical chemistry. So last time we were talking about electron-electron interactions and how these are very difficult to model in the real world. Because what it, they tend to do is generate a very kind of tricky form of a Hamiltonian. So I can generate a general Hamiltonian as more or less the sum of all my nice hydrogen one electron Hamiltonians. But then I have to deal with this pesky term of electron-electron repulsion. And the issue is, is that this is messy because it means that the nature of one electron and its position is going to depend on the nature of the second electron. And trying to deal with this through sheer quantum mechanics is kind of tough. However, there is a classic uh, uh, cheat method of trying to wiggle around having to deal with the full electron-electron repulsion. And that's by trying to bring this term into a modified form of our hydrogenic orbitals. And this is typically done by realizing that this positive repulsive electron-electron potential can be treated as more or less canceling out some of the attraction of an electron to the nuclei. You can think about the, uh, the electron wants to go near the nuclei, but there may be another electron in the way, which reduces how much it's kind of attracted in. The way I like thinking about this is a concert. The best concert has nobody in between you and the band. Soon as more people end up in, in between you and the band, essentially you get less of the music. And it's very similar here with the attraction to the nuclei. So we treat this effective nuclear charge, the amount that isn't canceled out, as ZEF. So this are again our classic effective nuclear charge, and there's not a really good way to determine this uh, theoretically. So typically what happens is it's determined empirically, but this also means that it needs to be determined empirically for each individual element, so for each natural Z you would start with, and each different orbital as each orbital experiences slightly different electron-electron repulsions. And it's worth noting that it would depend not just on the orbital, but on which other orbitals are occupied. It becomes a bit of a mess, but it actually has some practical use. So let's go ahead and look at, for example, helium 1s orbital. So in helium, we're going to have no angular uh, portion except for just a, uh, a normalization constant. And so our only attractive term is more or less going to be this, uh, uh, be an exponential decay term. So normally this would decay with Z, but I'm just going to replace that nuclear charge with how much of the nuclear charge does helium really see? It's going to be a little bit less, so this term's not going to be quite as big as it would be for, uh, for a helium plus, where I have only a single electron. And similarly, my die-off uh, from this exponential term isn't is also isn't going to be as fast, because this z effective is going to be a little bit less than 2. The electron feels a little bit less charged than the full 2. And so using this, we can imagine applying our Hamiltonians, and we get a new energy. And this energy is more or less going to be our classic Rydberg energy, but instead of times z squared, it's going to be times z effective squared. And again, over n, 1s electron, so that's 1 squared. And so this builds up a nice kind of simple, uh, simple description for the energy of one electron in the helium atom. And then we can kind of repeat the system for the net wave function for helium atom using our orbital approximation, because now I'm neglecting any electron-electron repulsion. So my total wave function should just be this modified wave function times itself, because both electrons occupy more or less the same position. So when we combine these two wave functions, it's just going to be more or less the same wave function, squaring the normalization constant, because I now have two wave functions, and then adding in the positions of the two atoms. Each, at, uh, each electron will be in a slightly different position, but when I integrate over all space, it's going to give me pretty much the energy you'd expect. And is still one, 
going to be adding the two energies together. So it's going to be negative twice the Rydberg constant times the Z effective squared. And we can imagine scaling this up for a more complex atom where you'll just simply add in the energy for each possible electron uh, times its uh, times the Rydberg times the Z effect uh, Z effective for that individual orbital. Now this gets a little bit tedious, but it can be a fairly good description to look at various stabilities of, um, of electrons in different orbitals for different atoms. However, most of the focus tends to be placed on uh, our good friends, the valence electrons. So if I have something like hydrogen, not too surprisingly, the electron feels the full charge of hydrogen, Z effective is one. However, when I deal with helium, each of those electrons is going to pretty much is going to feel just a little bit less than the full charge, say about 60% of it. So my total Z effective is a little bit less than we'd expect. So each of those electrons feels most of the nuclear charge, but again, a little bit of is, is canceled out by the electron electron repulsion. However, when we go to lithium, something fun here happens. As the full nuclear charge is three, but it turns out I feel 1.29. Now what ends up happening is most of that, uh, we'd expect for one full charge to not be canceled out by the core electrons. But it turns out a little bit of the effective nuclear charge get, <coughs> a little bit of additional effective nuclear charge essentially sneaks past those uh, 1s electrons and my 2s electrons still feels it. Now we see a similar effect when we get to beryllium. However, this one's a little bit of an odd case because it feels a little bit less nuclear charge than we would expect. We'd expect two of it to be uncanceled out. It's 1.29, but again, beryllium's a little bit odd. So now when we go to boron, this gets a little fun. I should have a net of three uh, uncanceled electrons. However, now I'm also dealing with the same thing I did with helium. Some of the electron is also being screened out by the other electron in, uh, by the two electron, uh, by the electrons in the 2s orbital. So if I'm in the 2s, a little bit's being screened out by the other electron in the 2s, and a little bit's being screened out by the one in the 2p. That one electron in the 2p, a lot of it is being screened out by the 2s orbitals. And as we go on and so forth, what you're going to find is slowly increasing Z effective as more and more of the nuclear, <clears throat> as two of the nuclear charges pretty much going to be screened out mostly by the core electrons. But we have to deal with a little additional screening. In the p orbitals, they're highly screened by the 2s uh, uh, electrons further in. We're talking about the 2s electrons, we're seeing a little bit of additional screening by the 2p. So this keeps on and go, uh, keeps on and so forth till the atom in the third and <clears throat> the second row that feels the most effective charge is neon. Because now all these electrons are feeling most of the core electron, uh, most of the nuclear charge. Again, a little bit of it being screened, uh, most of it being. Uh, the two core electrons in the 1s orbital are screening out pretty much their full charge. But again, we're also screening out a lot of these electrons also screen out a lot of the charge from their neighbors. Because again, I should have eight uncanceled electrons if they, uh, <coughs> uh, eight uncanceled charge getting past those 1s electrons. However, it's a little bit less than that. And that's because everybody's essentially trying to drink from the milk bowl and pushing each other out of the way. So nobody gets the full amount. And then when we reset to the next uh, system, again, I'd expect to see one, I see 2.5 because more and more is essentially seeping through the previous set of core electrons. And so in general rules, rules what we see is greater effect uh, Z effective as I go down the periodic table because the core electrons aren't perfectly screening and greater uh, Z effective as I go across the periodic table because most of the, uh, because the uh, 
uh, these valence electrons essentially, while they partially screen out each other, they still feel a good fraction of the total available eight nuclear charge that we would expect. Again, we reach some rather fun extremes when we get to Krypton because a lot of it's seeping through the core electrons and uh, all of your uh, electrons now sitting out in the fourth shell aren't so good at screening each other because they're more widely distributed. Now, one of the other things I do wanna make note of is where we're used to the 4S uh, electrons having a higher Z effective than the 4P, 3S than the 3P. Now, an interesting thing happens when we get down to the D shell because the D shell, so 3D, 4S, they, we typically fill up 4S faster than 3D. But an interesting thing here happens because the 3D um, orbitals are so close in that they tend to feel a big amount of, new, of effective nuclear charge. And so we'd expect them to fill faster. However, that said, the 4S, due to the odd shape of S orbitals, is able to often sneak in. And one of the reasons why is because we have a, <clears throat> uh, uh, they're often able to sneak in at areas closer than the other, uh, <coughs> other orbitals are able to, simply because remembering that they have a non-zero probability density at the nucleus. Not to mention, they're also spend most of their time on average further out, so they're a little less crowded. And it often is one of the things that makes S orbitals so immensely favorable. So one of the important things that is worth noting is that core electrons do spend a lot more time near the nuclei. 1S orbital, uh, 1S electrons are typically very near the nucleus. And so if I have a 2P electron, it's spending most of its time outside the 1S electron. But occasionally it's even or it's even enough that it's able to feel some of the nuclear charge. Now, one of the reasons why 2s orbitals always seem to have a higher Z effective than the 2p, despite being further out, is it's important to note that they have this little bump of high probability density really close to the core uh, to the nuclei. In fact, it's pretty much occurs very near the point at which we see 1s electron density. And this little bump is one of the reasons why s orbitals almost always have a hi uh, higher z effective than their equivalent p orbitals. And similar, 3s is always better than 3p, is always better than 3d. And this is going to really dictate how electrons fill up into a nucleus. It has a lot to do with this effective screening and this is entirely due to the nodal behavior of the electron density. So one of the things that is worth noting is again, this careful balance of <clears throat> uh, probability density far out so they don't suffer a lot of electron-electron repulsion, which S orbitals have, and a little bit of time close into the nuclei so they get a good WAP of attractive uh, potential, which S orbitals also have. So S orbitals are kind of rocking it most at the bulk, uh, taking most advantage of bulk ends. They suffer less electron-electron repulsion while maximizing nuclear effect. So this is going to have a lot of implications on orbital filling. However, we have yet to come up with a good description of how we can truly combine our atomic orbitals to make a good molec, uh, our hydrogenic orbitals to make a good atomic orbital. So we're going to do that next time, but we're going to have to uh, account for a couple of properties from particle physics. Until then, take care.